Hello everyone, Helen here. How are you today? I hope you're okay and thank you for stopping by. And a big welcome if you're a new subscriber, but welcome to everybody who's decided to spend a little bit of your precious time sitting with me. <laughs> and uh, oh, I'm really excited about the things I've got to share with you today. Uh, I know it won't be everybody's cup of tea, but um, I am excited about them. And you know how I love to just share the things that make me happy. And I know they do make some of you happy as well. So I've got one or two little makes to share with you. I've got a new story poem that I've written and, I've, and I'm going to share with you um, some purchases that I made at uh, one, one or two of the old bookshops uh, that I went to when I was last away in the camper van. So yeah, so let's get on with it. I often say, oh, I think this is going to be shorter than usual. I think it might be longer than usual today. <laughs> but I know most of you don't mind that. Yes, so. So yeah, so first of all, some makes and I uh, just have some tiny little makes to show you uh, mostly this week. Because sometimes when I show you things, I have actually been working on one of the ongoing projects. Like, you know, I have been doing a, my, one of my crochet blankets I've been working on. And I just, I don't show you that every time because you can't really tell that I've made much progress. Um, but the little things that I've been making this week. Well, first of all, um, I have made uh, Meg here, who I have shown you before, shown you last week, last time I think. Um, I've made her some shoes. So she was going to have boots, but I was just trying to use use up the bits of tufted alpaca yarn that I had left after making her and, and other things that I had. And I found that I only had enough yarn of this colour that I wanted to use for shoes but I think that's fine you know I think that's okay uh, and it was a nice little shoes and I made her a bag you can see just a little over the shoulder bag and she said she'd like a red button on it to go with her jumper and hat uh, so I found a little strawberry button there and so that, that's good so you're really you are complete aren't you there so you can sit down there and Yes, she has got a little friend there. I'll talk about this in a minute. The other tiny little project that I did was I was making as a gift for somebody um, which I haven't quite posted off yet. And that is a, a couple of teeny tiny uh, crochet gnomes. And actually, uh, there's a little toadstool and there's a wheelbarrow and a little spade because they are garden gnomes, I think. And this is by a designer that I have used quite a few times. I think she's called Laura Loves Crochet. Uh, I usually buy her patterns on Etsy, although she possibly is on Art Ravelry as well. And I follow her on Instagram. And when I saw these teeny tiny gnomes, I thought, oh, I've just got to make them. And they weren't too difficult, really. Um, what did I use? I used Scapia Stone Washed for most of those colours, if not all. Yeah, all apart from the white uh, and just uh, the thing I did differently to the pattern was that I just embroidered the eyes on and I didn't have any little safety eyes small enough and I just think the ones that I had would have looked a bit silly, a bit too big and yeah, so uh, the pattern comes with um, a, a PDF that you can print off to actually make a box to fit one of the gnomes in in to with his along with his wheelbarrow. So it's like a big matchbox, I suppose. But it's printed and it's it's got a little label on that you can fill in to say the gnome's name. So really lovely, fantastic little patterns. And no sewing up to do. It was done all in one. Yeah, so it's my kind of pattern that is. So I can highly recommend them if you like crocheting little little things. And it, it wasn't too fiddly, really. Um, yeah, so cute little gnomes are going to go off to their new home very soon. So I'm sure you would have noticed that I've got a, a pigeon sitting next to me here. Uh, this is a very special pigeon. And, you know, sometimes you're prompted to make something something inspires you to make something and often it's because you've seen 
you know, you've seen something that somebody else has made and you want to make one as well, or you see it in a book or whatever. There's various ways that you that something sparks you to um, to make something. But but this pigeon was a little bit different. I was awake a very early one Sunday morning. Uh, my husband, Phil, he loves to have the radio set to come on in the morning, even though it doesn't really wake him up. It wakes me up, but not him. Um, anyway, there happened to be a programme early one Sunday morning, um, all about pigeons. And uh, and I heard all about a particular pigeon that I'd never heard of before. And this was a pigeon called Winky. So my pigeon is called Winky. This is Winky the pigeon. And she was a very special pigeon. And rather than me tell you her story now, I've actually written a new story poem all about Winky the Pigeon. And I have, I've recorded it in a, um, I've recorded it separately because, oh, sometimes if I stumble over words, then it just makes it harder to edit if I've done all of this chat first as well. So here is my story of uh, Winky the Pigeon. Ode to Winky, a brave and gallant pigeon. Back in the 1940s, when the world was all at war, a pigeon known as Winky lived upon a Scottish shore. Her pigeon loft stood proudly by the sparkling River Tay, in a place called Broughty Ferry, near Dundee, not far away. She'd fly from distant places through the day and in the night, for she was a homing pigeon, with senses keen and bright. Her plumage was so fine, in shades of emerald and grey, her eyes they shone perceptively at every time of day. Her wings were strong and powerful, through starry skies she glided, her character resilient and always single-minded. And no one had an inkling of what Winky's future held, this dear little pigeon who, in wartime, would excel. And so, like many others who'd signed up to join the fight, Winky found she'd got a job that used her trusty flight. With four brave airmen, Winky flew on missions far and wide, their plane a Beaufort bomber fighting enemies with pride. When messages were sent off to the air crew's Scottish base, Winky was the carrier. She'd fly at quite a pace. In February 1942, a mission over Norway, the plane was hit by enemy fire and radioed a mayday. The night was grim, the winds were strong, the plane ditched in the sea. The airmen managed hurriedly to help themselves break free and utilised the life raft, taking Winky's cage out with them, and called upon that inner strength they all might find within them. Their only hope, a little bird, a duty to perform. She'd have to brave the elements, fly through the raging storm. Though Winky hated wind and rain and hail and driving snow, she left the cage, spread out her wings, and homeward she did go. Her glossy feathers covered with the filthy engine oil. On she flew, the icy winds intensified her toil. Despite the seething sea, by her instinct she was driven. Winky's mind was faithful to the mission she was given. Fifty miles went by, and then another fifty flown. Twenty more, and soon she'd see her little pigeon home. Exhausted, cold and dirty, Winky gave a final swoop and flew down to the pigeon loft to find her cosy coop. George Ross, her owner, spotted her and feeling great concern, he phoned the air base instantly about the bird's return. The RAF consulted maps and made a calculation and very soon were flying off to find the right location of the airmen who were stranded on the wild and choppy ocean, who thought about the pigeon with a passionate emotion. A few days passed, and Winky, 
who had rested and recovered, her oily feathers cleaned and dried, no worse for what she'd suffered. One afternoon her owner came and said she'd been invited to a celebration dinner, and Winky was delighted. She basked in glory in her cage, while all around gave praise, especially the airmen whose lives were bravely saved. And near the end of 43, another fine occasion, a ceremonial gathering and a first commemoration of heroic contribution and the saving of four men, the Dickon Medal given to the Pigeon Heroine. And Winky was the first to get this honourable award. Many other animals would earn the same reward for efforts given selflessly in times of strife and war. Brave animals whose actions we just could not ignore. Winky's homing instincts we never will forget. Forever we'll be thankful and always in her debt. Her medal and stuffed body still preserved in old Dundee on show in the museum for all of us to see. A statue made of bronze is in her birthplace, Broughty Ferry. So the gallant tale of Winky stays forever legendary. So isn't that amazing? That is a true story about a pigeon who uh, saved lives in the Second World War. So, yeah, so, and uh, I knitted uh, uh, Winky from a book that I've made quite a few birds from called uh, Knitted Aviary by Sue Stratford. And um, the other birds are quite, they're smaller than the pigeon. And the pigeon in the book looked like it was going to be the same size as a robin, for example. And so I decided I wanted to make her more life size. And I didn't have any iron weight yarn uh in my stash of the right colors because obviously i needed the right colors for a pigeon uh, so i ordered some which really i didn't want to do but i had to buy great big balls of aran i decided to try a, a yarn i hadn't tried before yarn smith's yarn and it is it's very nice and soft i i don't I think I liked it as much as Stylecraft Special DK or Special Aran or the Stylecraft yarns, but it is very nice and soft. I think it would probably make a nice jumper. It is. It's all acrylic, um, and uh, but it was perfect for Winky. I think actually, she's not quite life size. I, I probably could have used a, an even thicker yarn, but anyway, um, there were lots of bits to sew together to make her. But I, I am very pleased with how she's. Uh, turned out. I, I wasn't going to bother with putting the white felt behind the eye because oh, I just thought, oh no, I can't be bothered. But actually I'm glad I did because I think that, uh, I don't know, that just does add something. So so there we are, Winky the Pigeon, an amazing, an amazing story as well. Uh, yeah, so w when we were away in the camper van last time, one of the places we went to was somewhere we visited the last time we were in the area and that was to Wigton or Wigtown, I'm not sure how you, how you say it. It's the um, a town that specialises in second-hand bookshops and um, yeah, sort of valuable books and new books. It's just a bookshop town really and uh, we, we really, really enjoyed visiting it the previous time so we went back. And I found some lovely things, so I'm going to share a, a bit of that with you today. And uh, so I, I found a couple of bits of old music. So one of the things I like to collect, I wouldn't say I was a serious collector. It's just if um, if I'm in a bookshop, uh, then I add to my collection. And one of my collections is of um, sort of vintage uh, piano music, particularly if it's aimed at schools and young children and things. I just, that's just a, a thing I'm interested in because in case you don't know, I was a primary school teacher. And so I found a lovely book here uh, called Dramatised Nursery Rhymes. I uh, hadn't seen anything quite like this before. Uh, so I'm really pleased with that. I just enjoy looking in them, you know, it's not that I'm really going to use them exactly. Um, 
And then this one, I absolutely love this one. 24 Marches for the Schoolroom by Albert H. Oswald, who I found out is actually a composer who was born in County Durham. He lived in, in County Durham, where I live. And, and it just, I picked this up and it just made me smile because when, when I was um, working in schools, and one of the things I loved to do was to have children marching around to some music. And so that it, it kind of made me reminisce about uh, how, how lovely that was doing that. But And the, the music itself, well, you're going to hear a bit of the music a bit later on. Um, I've, I've recorded a couple of the um, uh, tunes that are in here. They're very um, sort of predictable um I suppose a bit I don't know I don't know how to describe them really they're not, they're not kind of top-notch classical music pieces but they're rather lovely and this this was published around about 1912 and it's just the music feels very kind of Edwardian or around about that time so I'm very very pleased with that Another book that I bought was this little one here, which is a book of poems. It's called The Wherefore and the Why by somebody called A.P. Herbert. And he's written um, poems about different animals and creatures uh, uh, in a way that he's trying to teach them something about, about the animals. And it just reminded me of... Uh, one or two of the poems that I've written about leaves that with that had the I had the idea of teaching you about a uh, leaf, and uh, so yeah, so it just oh I thought oh yeah that's somebody doing something that I like to do as well using a poem to teach people about something. So and I'll, I'll read you something from that another time. Uh, I also bought this beautiful book here called Everyday Things for Lively Youngsters. Uh, this was uh, published, I think this one was 1930, yeah, 1938 this one was published. And it's it's a book to teach uh, children about mostly things to do with science, but I just love the illustrations just the drawings and diagrams that really appeals to me there's diagrams on one side and then sort of just text on the other side and it just makes me smile and then finally this is the book I'm going to spend a bit of time on with you today which I hope you'll find interesting if not well that's fine but I absolutely love this book it's called The Fireside Lesson Book and it's a book aimed at teaching children all sorts of things, right from the word go, learning the alphabet, to all sorts of things. Um, I, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not going to talk about it too much now because I've done a little video of me uh, looking through this book and uh, reading bits out of it for you. Uh, and I'm following that with uh, giving you a closer look at the, some of the illustrations from this book because I love them as well. I just love everything about this book. And and that that uh, little bit is accompanied by two of the uh, piano pieces from this book here. I've, I've recorded March of the Gnomes and March of the Wood, Wooden Soldiers. And I set my piano, my digital piano, to honky-tonk piano so, so that uh, you'd kind of get a bit of an authentic sound. I mean, this book is in a little bit of a state. I don't buy things for the condition that they're in. I do, but I definitely never judge a book by its cover when I buy these old books. It's really all to do with what's inside. So come and have a little peep inside this book with me. A is for Alice who lives on the hill. B is for Bernard, who works at the mill. C is for Clara, who has a fine jewel. D is for Donald, who brought in the fuel. E is for Edward, who loves a good book. F is for Fanny, who is learning to cook. G is for Gerald, who has just won a prize. H is for Harry, whose aunt sends him pies. I is for Isabel, who has gone for a sail. 
J is for Janet, who has written a tale. K is for Kenneth, who climbed up a tree. L is for Lawrence, whose age is just three. M is for Marcy, in French she can talk. N is for Nora, who went for a walk. O is for Oswald, who paints very well. P is for Percy, who a story can tell. Q is for Quentin, who is now growing tall. R is for Rose, who is only quite small. S is for Stephen, about to leave school. T is for Thomas, who fished in the pool. U is for Ursula, who has a young brother. V is for Victor, who is fond of his mother. W is for William, who pushes the plough. X is for Xerxes, a name not used now. Y is for Yorick, who looks very meek. Z is for Zoe, a name from the Greek. And there are so many different alphabet rhymes, ways of teaching children the alphabet in this book. This is still, I think, quite a well-known one. A was an apple pie, B bit it, C cut it, D dealt it. And this one isn't known to me. And I love it that they've got slightly coloured pictures in places. A little bit of colour, that must have been really exciting to the children who had it. The little men of A, B, C. The Dutch dolls A, B, C. So all of the letters are made using you know, wooden dolls. Is that a Dutch doll? I don't know about Dutch dolls. Arthur has apples and arrows and arcs. Beatrice draws berries and bridges and barks. Cecil eats cherries and currants and cakes. Dora feeds dolphins and ducklings and drakes. Edward sees engines and eagles and eyes. Fanny fears ferrets and falcons and flies. Gerald knows gardens and gorges and glens. Hilda loves heroes and horses and hens. Ivan bought ices and ivory and inks. Janet played jugglers and jogtrot and jinx. Kenneth keeps kittens and kestrels and kids. Laura cleans lampshades and laces and lids. Morris makes magic and magnets and maps. Nancy likes nightcaps and nutmegs and naps. Oswald found oysters and opals and otters. Peggy drew pictures of parrots and potters. Quentin sold quadrants and quinces and quails. Ruby counts raindrops and ripples and rails. Stanley takes sugar and salad and soups. Thora watched turkeys and titmice and troops. Urban the urchin my ulster will use. Vera is fond of both valleys and views. Wilfred caught weasels and wasps in the west. Xanthi a xylonite, zyster possessed. Yorick plants yuccas and yarrows and ewes. Xena strokes zebras and zebus at zoos. I love this section on words, uh, using pictures to try and help children um, understand the different kinds of words that we've got. So we've got verbs here and uh, adjectives, opposites here. Here we've got some similes, as wet as a fish, as soft as a mole, as white as a lily, as round as an apple, as rough as a mat, as brown as a berry, as calm as a cat, as flat as a pancake, as white as a sheet, as dead as a doornail, as red as a beet, as hard as a millstone, as dark as a pall, as bright as a sixpence, as thick as a wall, as plump as a partridge, as brisk as a bee, as fat as a porpoise, as wild as the sea, as fit as a fiddle, as deep as a well, as dry as a herring, as clear as a bell. And then we go on to a section about maths, picture arithmetic. So lots of opportunities for practising counting. And I love this one, where it's giving different kinds of um, the meanings for the words. So we've got one eye, two eyes, three eyes on a potato, four eyes. I think they're eyes and hooks on the dress. One mouth, two mouths, they're river mouths, three mouths, baby birds, four mouths, one foot, <laughs> as in a ruler, two feet, three feet and four feet, one leg, two legs, three legs, four legs, one hand, two hands, 
three hands and four hands. Really imaginative. Artists, all of us, making pictures of the things we see. Shakespeare says in one of his plays that if we could cast off this muddy vesture of decay, we should be able to hear the music of the spheres. He means that if we were more thoughtful and quiet, we should find that all the sights and sounds about us are really beautiful and pleasant, and that if they do not seem so to us, the fault is not in these things, but lies in ourselves. Now artists, who include poets, writers of books, musicians, painters, designers, sculptors and architects, are those who hear this music of the spheres, and put it down so that the rest of us may hear it too. A first lesson on drawing familiar things. Before we begin to draw, there are several points to be discussed. We will look at the materials we are to use in our work. 1. I want all the little ones to use crayons or chalks rather than pencils. The crayons must be soft and not greasy. Your mind must work readily through your fingers and the muscles of your hand must become very sensitive. This cannot happen if hard and unyielding pencils are used. 2. Do not bother about an India rubber. If you do use one, it must be soft, but you won't want one. It is only a very bad crutch. We want to learn to walk, not to be ever propping ourselves up. Drawing the things we see. We are learning to hear the beautiful music that is at the heart of everything. When we all can hear it and love it, then the golden age will have come. Many are seeing the dark night change into the beautiful colours of the dawn of this age and are glad. We all want to see them too and to feel the gladness. None of us can reach the beautiful land of rainbow hues or hear the glad grand music of it but those whose feet are on the highway that leads to it. Now this highway is called knowledge so we must read and work on steadfastly that we may come without loss of time into this promised land. And the next chapter is all about muddling with clay. And it just takes you through really, really gently into what you need and some ideas of things to make. So we've got a mushroom, a boat and a bell and a match stand. What's a match stand? It's just somewhere to keep the matches that you've lit the candles with. And here's a chapter on learning French. So we've got a page of uh, how to tell the time in French, how to say the different times there. We've got some, just a simple vocabulary of familiar things on this page. Two verbs, avoir and être and some sentences about getting up in the morning. And then I love this next little section in this chapter because it's got it's got all of the sentences in French but also translated directly underneath. So there's there's quite a lot of these where it's in French and then in English. And we even have some French songs here. So a little action game here. The little shepherdess. And this is how we plant the seeds. Oh yes, I know that one. On the bridge at Avignon. Sur le pont d'Avignon, l'on y danse, l'on y danse. Sur le pont d'Avignon, l'on y danse tout en rond. And some poetry in French and English as well. And some more stories. So lots and lots. It's quite a big section, this French section. Oh, and this is the chapter that I went to first when I first picked up this book, The Little Book of Music. And I love just the title of this page here, The Piano and How It Speaks to Us. We can learn nothing without trying in this world, and often we must try very hard. But to those who would really try, 
nothing brings such great pleasure as music. And if we go the right way to work, even the youngest of us will find that learning the piano is quite interesting and not so very difficult. And then this little section here for the teacher. The child may now play a little tune, but should not yet make any attempt to read printed music from a book. The lessons are based on the principle that the natural way of learning is by imitation. The teacher now sings and plays with the right hand. The tune given at the top of the next page, the pupil playing and singing it after her from memory. Then the next four bars may be taken and learned in the same way. Even at this early stage, the teacher should see that the child sits correctly at the instrument and plays with a loose wrist. And so then we have some very first tunes here and little bits of advice for the teacher. Oh, it's just lovely. And then all about the staff, about reading the notes and yeah, just learning all those things that will be necessary. And then we've got some uh, pieces here which have got a simple part for the child to play and a, a part underneath for the teacher to accompany, make it into a little, little duet, Christmas carol there. I love the name of this song, Piggy Wiggy Wig and Piggy Wiggy Wee. <laughs> the North Wind Doth Blow, got the little baby bear, smiles and frowns, only one mother the whole world over, ten fairies guide her fingers. Oh, I just love the titles of these songs. And here we have a chapter on health and keeping healthy. And we've got some simple exercises in the nursery. I don't think it means nursery school. I think it means at, at home in the bedroom, in the child's bedroom. Lovely, lovely pictures here. What to do with your dumbbells. <laughs> uh, Easy exercises for the home. Oh, such lovely photographs. Nine exercises and a game. Oh. And so here we have a little section on natural history. And we can learn about all sorts of different animals. An elephant here, a squirrel, Mr. Prickly Ball. It's a story about a hedgehog. There's a poem here about the squirrel and how to paint the squirrel. So it's not just uh, giving you facts, it's actually wanting you to interact with learning about these things. The mysterious egg. So I love it. I love this combination of stories about the animals and poems and um, suggestions of artwork, how to draw the animals. It's one about the magpie. The Australasian kangaroo, the earthworm over here. And ah, now there's a section on first aid. Again, a lovely uh, photograph here of St John's Ambulance uh, practicing their first aid on a volunteer. But it's not just first aid, here we've got some information about uh, our bodies, the bones and arteries of our bodies. How to treat broken bones, fractures, dislocations and sprains. And this next chapter is really is very fascinating. Tales of the great word family. Perhaps you have never thought when using a word of the great adventures through which the word has passed. But if we could write the lives of words as we write the lives of men, there would be no book more enthralling than a book on the great adventure of the English language. All over the earth it would take us, and back to the oldest and remotest places, far beyond the reach of civilization, and into ages long forgotten. Nobody knows how old words are. Some are older than the history of nations. Some are not so old as you. And so then it follows on that they choose a, um, a one part of a word, so words with ak in them, ak or ac, and all of the words that have stemmed from that root. Got the Altus family, the Ambulaire family, 
and it is really really interesting and what lovely illustrations as well and the book finishes with a chapter called schoolroom lectures and there is a very diverse range of topics so some of these lectures they're so they differ so much i think i'd like to read some of these to you but maybe another time got life forever and ever immortality this one this one is it and then we have a, uh, a lecture on the house sparrow the music of handel how to read the value of things a lecture about somebody called arnold toynbee oh i have to read that find out who he is another one on music a composer how to write a lecture on strength Beauty in the fields, how to cure headaches, how to sing, the old oak in the park, the tale of a teacup. Oh, just, oh, just brilliant. I haven't read any of them yet, so I'm looking forward to reading those. And perhaps I can share some of them with you. Well, I really hope that you did enjoy having a little look through that old book. Um, I guess if you've stayed with me this far, it probably means that you have. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I will be returning to that book because the, the little schoolroom lectures that I showed sort of at the end of the book are just fascinating. Uh, they're quite amusing in some ways. And I love the way that that book is not at any time talking down to children. It's assuming that children are just going to be 
um, you know, absorbing everything. It doesn't matter how complicated. And yeah, ah, I, I love everything about that book. So anyway, I am going to go now and I will be back with you very soon, hopefully with a camper van video. Um, I'm, I've been a bit slow getting that one together. So who knows whether it'll be next week or the week after, but it will be coming sometime soon. But until I see you again, take great care of yourself. Keep yourself nice and busy doing the things you like to do. And I will see you soon. Okay, then. Bye.